I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. So Kevin Hussey is currently the manager of JPL's Visualization Technology Applications and Development Group in the Office of Communications and Education. Mm -hmm. uh, only the government has uh, uh, long titles like that. But Kevin has spent the majority of his 37-year career pioneering innovative tools and techniques to graphically represent virtually every type of data and abstract information used by NASA and Walt Disney feature animation. He did a lot of work with them. And so he's a uh, rich history in, in the movies and in animation. He's consulted with the FBI, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and many, many other places. And so... Um, we're really excited to have him with us. His focus is on creating 3D real-time interactive computer graphic systems, and you're going to get exposed to one of those this evening. And so please welcome Kevin Husky. Hello, everyone. It, it really is, uh, it is nice to be here with you. It is always strange to do this because I am in my office at JPL. Um, it, it certainly appears I'm talking to myself, which I do, but that's beside the point. What I want to make sure of is that this presentation is geared toward you. Uh, I do enjoy presenting this material, and I the one main criticism I get when I do is I do it too quickly. I move the interactive too uh, quickly so that I lose people. So I will consider this a success if after I'm done you feel comfortable and are able to use NASA's eyes for your own purposes, either to enjoy exploring the solar system or using it as a tool to educate or to demonstrate to others. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna pretend like you've never used eyes on the solar system, and I'm going to just walk you through the process of uh, how you'd use it, how you go about it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I think I'll share my screen. So you don't have to look at my mug. There we go. Here, look at my desktop. All right. And um, what I'm going to do first, I'm going to bring up a web browser because the most important website for us is eyes.nasa.gov. Okay, you can see here, eyes.nasa.gov. When you go to that website, you will have the ability to do the following. The most important button here is the download the application to get started button. And if you're on a Mac, you download it and oh, Mac or Windows. Okay, we're working on a Linux build. We're, we're in fact we're testing a Linux build. But right now, it's Mac and Windows. When you download and install this software, you are going to get this icon on your desktop. So before I take you to the icon, I just want to show you that on the web page, uh, you'll have the ability to go directly into some of our applications where you, if you click this grand finale button, it will take you to a module inside of Eyes on the Solar System. Here are three modules I'm going to demonstrate this evening. Eyes on the Earth, Solar System, and Exoplanets. And then we have these special tours that we'll, I'll show you. We have Eyes on the Earth events. In fact, there's one from today, from the 17th. We may take a look at that when we go to Eyes on the Earth. And then we have other apps that are web apps. DSN Now, which is actually our most pop popular app that allows you to see the entire operations of the Deep Space Network, exactly where we're communicating to uh, from our three locations around the globe, Canberra, Australia, Goldstone, California, and Madrid, Spain. Um, and then... Down here at the bottom, you'll see Site Manager Kevin Hussey. If you have email questions, please send me an email. Either I will answer my producer or one of our programmers. Okay, so let's assume that you've successfully downloaded and installed NASA's Eyes. When you do, you're going to get this icon. And the process is basically you're downloading and installing a relatively small video game. We build this application on top of the Unity 3D game engine. And so you say you download maybe 100 meg, uh, but that 100 meg opens the window to the data that we've put up on the uh, Amazon cloud, which is about 275 gigabytes of data that you'll have access to. We don't put more, we don't cache more than a gig and a half on your computer, but we don't send you anything that you don't ask for, right? 
So again, this is a live demonstration. Um, I'm going to go ahead and double click on this icon. And if I check, if you see me look to the right, I also have this running on my Mac. I'm doing this on a, a PC laptop and my Mac laptop so I can kind of see the response time to make sure that you guys are seeing what I'm, what I'm wanting you to see. And the lag right now looks very minimal, so it's, this is encouraging. So this is our splash screen that you get when you double click. And you can go from here. You can start Eyes on the Earth, Solar System, or Exoplanets. Now I'm going to take you in the order that we created these. And believe it or not, even here at JPL, we started with Eyes on the Earth. Uh, people don't know this, don't know this but 33% of our budget at JPL is for Earth science. It's really important. In fact, I am a climatic geomorphologist by training and got hired at JPL as a grad student in 1979 to process Landsat data and to digitize maps. So we were asked to find a way to demonstrate to the public or to show the public NASA's Earth observing fleet. So here's uh, eyes on the Earth. And whenever we, we advise you to go full screen, I recommend it. So I'm going to click the full screen button. And now you have the Earth. I'm just going to click and drag. And you can see you can spin the globe. And these satellites traveling about aren't just traveling willy-nilly. They are, in fact, the locations of those satellites at the time you see at the bottom left of the screen. So for example, if I, I click the button here that says real time, you're now looking at where these satellites are while we speak. Okay, so I'm going to start with a satellite. Um, let's look at SMAP, Soil Moisture Active Passive. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this. And if you click again, we will take you to the location that the satellite is in real time. So this is where SMAP is now. Granted, this is not a live picture of the Earth, nor is it a, a, a chase plane, if you will, for the satellite. But it does show you that the SMAP is precisely in this location, traveling as fast as you see it and in the direction that you see it. Okay, so. Um, we do this with all of NASA's Earth Observing Fleet. Uh, again, you have control. You can look you know, pretty much any direction. And what we do is we provide some things for the public because people don't realize how big or small these satellites are. So over in the left-hand side, you can see we have a button that says Compare Size. So let's go ahead and throw a scientist out there with, with SMAP. And you can see right away that that is a rather large satellite. Yes, our scientist is not properly dressed for space. Um, she would definitely need a spacesuit. Uh, Caltech Legal wants me to tell you that when you go into space, make sure you wear that spacesuit. Um, I tell folks that, yes, this, this would really hurt, but not for long. All right, enough of her. We can also go and compare to a school bus. And this would be truly the magic school bus. And I'm just going to ignore that phone. I'm just going to ignore it. It's very hard to do. Um, and, okay, so here we do this. I call these kind of the parlor tricks, if you will, for, um, for eyes. The real strength of eyes isn't with comparing and looking where it is and be able to look at the models but it's about the data. And at the top of the screen, you can see where it says the vital signs of the planet. So I'm gonna go ahead now and just show you some of these. Uh, first, let me go, I'll go home. Oh, by the way, these are in the proper height location. Jason 3 is, is the highest satellite, the lowest would be uh, the ISS, all right? Um, let's get to the meat of this. And the meat of this are these data sets. I'm gonna start with, let's look at carbon monoxide. I'm gonna click it. And now what you're seeing is you're seeing the entire carbon monoxide footprint for the Earth on a three-day average. So this is May 15th through the 17th. We update this data every day. And right now it looks pretty good. What I'm going to do, oh, before I do it, I want to note that not only do we do a visualization of the data, where in this case the cooler the color indicates the lower the concentration level of carbon monoxide, the warmer the color, the higher. 
But if you look at this key at the bottom right, and you roll your cursor over the screen, you'll see that we actually report the data values. So here in India, we've got like 140, 37, 48 parts per billion. This is about as good as you're ever going to see the world. And I'll prove that by saying, choose some dates. Let's do a time series. So I'm going to go back and grab the month of April. In fact, I'll go from April through today. I'm going to submit these dates. And I want you to watch what's going on here. You can look at, okay, by the way, carbon monoxide is something that is produced with the incomplete combustion of fossil fuel. And there's nobody burning anything out here in the Pacific, obviously. Now, maybe a couple of ships. But where we're getting action is from Asia, right? You've got a billion people here, a billion people here, and a billion people in China. Now, when they pollute, look where it goes. It comes across, and it builds up here. You know, we are big one, I wouldn't say happy, one big dysfunctional family, so we have to live with each other, if you know what I mean. But at least with this software, we can actually see where the pollution is coming from and where it's going. And I'm just going to roll my cursor over some of these higher values. So you're looking at numbers here um, that are in the three and four hundreds, if I can get you to. Oh, by the way, I can pause. The animation. All right, you get the idea. So we do this. This is just carbon monoxide. We've got uh, temperature. The blue line is the zero degrees um, Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit line. And you can do time series for temperature. So out here in Saudi Arabia, I was there two weeks ago. So the average daytime temperature there is 103 degrees from sunup to sundown, 105. A little warm. Um, whereas here in Southern California, we've been dealing with temperatures in the 60s. Basically today, it didn't get out of 60 degrees. So you get the idea. Now, these are daily, these are updated every day. In fact, we update them like four times a day. Um, we also have data sets for, um, let me see, let me show you, oh, carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is interesting because if you look at the scale down here, you can see that the reds and oranges are up in the 400 range. And many of you may remember that we did cross the average 400 mark a year or two ago. So it, it's a little red, all right? But what I like to show is uh, we do have, like, besides just having the ability to, to, to look at values, we do put some historic data in. So down here, you'll see that there's an animation of carbon dioxide since 2002. I want you to note, note the scale, it's the same scale, where blues are low values in the 370s, reds are high values in the 400s. Watch what happens over the course of about 14 years. Okay, things look pretty good. We're in uh, February, and I mean, if we're in 2004. I'm going to let this speak for itself. And believe me, I get a wide variety of guests here at JPL. And I show this, and... I show it not to depress them, but just to say that we deal with data. And, uh, you know, I show, I do data visualization. You can argue about why this is happening, but you cannot argue that it isn't happening. It's just like, you know, it's like I'm not thrilled when I get on the scale in the morning, but it's data. Okay. Uh, all right. So there's this animation. Let me show you a much a more, let's say, lighter animation. So I was showing you an animation about carbon dioxide. I've shown you some monoxide. Under data sets, you can look at a whole series of data animations. And one of the one of the favorite ones we've done lately is our atmospheric rivers. We had a very wonderful rainstorm in the January time frame. Watch this. You can see the you can see this moisture coming from the tropics, pumping up to and dumping onto California. It was wet, but no one here was complaining because it, it, it really helped with our drought. Now, this animation was derived at the Science Visualization Studio, our partners at Goddard. Uh, these guys do the best visualizations, and this was the first one we've ever just mapped onto the globe. So we generate, uh, we get data from various sources and map them onto the globe. Okay, so. I'm hoping that you're writing down questions about eyes on the earth. 
Um, I could spend the entire hour going over stories from this. Oh, I did show, say that I was going to look at an event. So let's say you're here, you're looking at good old U.S., and you see up that the latest event is this volcano with ash. So if you click this, what we do is we give you geographic context. So we slowly move the cursor, move you to that location. We put the image in, and then we allow you to, to read about it, and we allow you to zoom in a bit to look at the ash from this volcano. So we, we have an editor that's in our Earth Science Department that looks for these stories, and we add them into eyes so that every week we have one or two of these that are of interest. Okay, so here's... Kevin, could I jump in with a quick question here? Yes, please do. So uh, we had a, um, a couple of questions about carbon monoxide, which we might, um, David, it looks like, answer those. But Jeffrey asks, can you change the scale uh, between Fahrenheit and Celsius on this? I know a lot of uh, educators in particular like to uh, um, try to, you know, teach the, the Celsius yep. scale. So. so the answer is yes. Up at the top right, in, in many of our apps, we have a toolbox. And here, you can put city names on. But if you look down here, there's a little thermometer. Switch to centigrade. So there you go. All right, so the units now. So instead of being 105, it's at 40 degrees. Okay, so that's how you can do it here. And in Eyes on the Solar System, we allow it as well. Okay, so any other? what's the other question? Oh, we just had a, a couple questions about... Uh, why is the most of the carbon monoxide up here in the northern hemisphere, which I think you briefly touched on, because most You're, of the people. Most production. of the people. Most of the people. Mm -hmm. Now, if I go back to uh, both for carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, during the, during the harvest season, South America, you will see massive fires. When I showed you, um, when I showed you, uh, I went back to just last month. Let me go back a little further. Let me go back into... Let's go back to like October of last year. So I'm going back to, well, oh, I went to, I hit the year button. Sorry, folks. So here's December 2016. Just going to October. So let's grab, oh, mid September to the end of October. Watch this through Halloween. And you'll see that. Ah. All right. Oh, what year am I in? 16. Okay. If there's no data, we don't we can't show you the data, but you'll see that we had issues. I'm moving fast again, sorry. Africa and South America, these are typical hot spots because they do slash and burn agriculture. The people there cut down the rainforest and burn it to clear away for their crops. Right? So anyway, so that answers where people are, you're gonna see more. Or a lot of times there's forest fires. So Remember when I showed you the event? Gosh, there's so much. So I'm going to go back to events. If you look down under here, you see fires, right? Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to say, all right, let's look at, here's fires and smoke in southern Chile. Then I can go and look at the carbon monoxide for this period, and you're going to see a lot of carbon monoxide coming out of Chile during this time. But So it's either natural or human fires are the most egregious or coal-fired plants like you'll see in China and India we are very good at cleaning our carbon we still put out the most co2 but we're very low in co okay it's through the incomplete combustion you'll find co any other questions before I move on to eyes on the solar system we're good for now thank you right. so a couple ways you can get the eyes on the solar system back in the toolbox here You'll see this little, looks like a little exit here where it says exit program to eyes main menu. We come back, always check for updates, and you'll come back to the main menu. Now, eyes on the solar system. Simple versus advanced. The simple version is for people over age 13. Actually, I can make that about 20. This is for older people who are afraid to push buttons on a computer. Okay? This is for everybody else. Kids love the advanced version because they're not afraid to explore. This was done for some sponsors who were intimidated by this interface. Just saying that, if I have any sponsors online, you know I love you, okay? Okay, now, um, I'm going to click advanced. 
So we did eyes first because we've got funding from the Earth Science Directorate here to do Earth first. But my boss said, hey, you know, 66% of our funding comes from solar system exploration. Can you please do the same thing, but instead of the Earth, do the whole solar system? Sure, sure, Blaine, we could do that. Can you, can you give me some money? Which they did. So now we, we recommend you go full screen. You're going to go full screen. Now what you see here looks like a very mundane or normal view of our solar system. It looks like a textbook. But what we've done is we've converted your mouse into a virtual camera that you can place anywhere inside or outside the solar system from 1950 to 2050, and I'm not exaggerating, okay? Anywhere. Inside or outside from 1950 to 2050. So I'm going to start by, I'm just scrolling back my mouse wheel, right? Now I'm going to click and drag. Okay. And now what am I going to do? Oh, so, so the couple things are kind of interesting. If you look down here under your speed and rate, see this number 29 miles per hour. By the way, let me cover this right away under visual controls. If you want to go metric, there you go. There's kilometers per hour. Okay. So it turns out our solar system drifts through the galaxy at about 29 miles an hour. That's just 29 miles an hour is our base speed. But when I click and drag, what this number is is the camera speed. Right now we're locked on the sun, so the sun's drifting at 29 miles an hour. If I click and drag, watch the speed. So in order to get around from, we're going fast. These are trillions of miles an hour, all right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to double click on Anything with a label in ICE products is fair game. So right now we have a, a, a 3D camera. It's an orbital camera that's locked on the sun. It would be awful boring if all you could do is zoom in and out at the sun. But like I said, anything with a label, we will shift your camera to orbit that feature. So I'm going to double click on Jupiter. And we're going to go to Jupiter. And there's Jupiter. Right, I'm going to flip it over so the red spot's where it belongs in the southern hemisphere. And then I'm going to scroll back, and I'm going to scroll back until we find our friend Juno, who is viewing Jupiter. So this is where Juno is on May 17th at 6.26.54 p.m. Hey, that's right now, Pacific time. So these locations that you see for the Earth, for the solar system, these are as accurate as can be determined. I use the same spice kernels that our navigators use. We input those into the game engine and allow you to do this. I'm going to click on Juno. So now you're going to be at the Juno spacecraft, revolving at three revolutions a minute, looking back toward Jupiter. So if you were at Juno with a 60-degree field of view, that's how big Jupiter would look to you. And if you wanted to see what it looked like for real, there's a button down here. It looks like a little camera. If I click this button... Then I turn off artificial lighting, take off all the lines, okay? Looks kind of cool. Um, I can, let me just do this. I'm going to go ahead and bring up, this little button here just brings up the bottom panel. I'm going to speed up time a little bit. So, Kevin, as you're working through this, I remember when Juno was doing its orbital insertion maneuvers and they were broadcasting this on, uh, I believe it was on NASA TV to see yes. what the view was. Was that actually NASA Eyes that was doing that? That was NASA Eyes. That was NASA Eyes. So I'm going to go back to real rate and show you how this. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and take it out of this mode, um, turn off my little camera. And what you can do is I'm going to, if I zoom back, let's do this. I'm going to scroll. I'm going to scroll back, and when you get a certain distance, I'm just scrolling back very quickly. Oh, it's not coming up right now. Let me, let me go out of here to make make. I'm going to take a trip out to the Kuiper Belt very quickly. Oh, and Kevin, just a yeah. quick question on how you're zooming in and out using the scroll wheel on your mouse. On my mouse. Scroll wheel on the mouse. All right. Mm -hmm. We don't have any. Uh, we, it looks like we don't have a texture map for make make, which I can understand. But I want to go back to Jupiter here. Um, oh, we do. We do have a. And I'm not getting the. There we go. So you see on the left hand side these Jupiter's features? 
So we added this for the for the orbit insertion. So I can do I could turn on its radiation field. And this was done from a scientific model. So there's the radiation field that surrounds Jupiter. This is the um, magnetosphere. I'll add the magnetosphere. The aurora, north and south. And then, of course, there are rings. You can't see them very well from the ground. In fact, you can't, but you can see them when you're close. And then, let me find Juno again. Let's go to Juno. So I'm at May 18th. You can see that I've changed the date to May 18th. So on May 18th, this will be your view. And I, shoot, I lost all my, uh, I've lost my uh, accoutrements, if you will. Um, sorry about that. But anyway, this is the view you get on May 18th. Now, here, this is like, this is a camera view. It turns everything off. But you can do the following. Under visual controls, you can, you can go ahead and turn off orbit lines or labels, spacecraft trails, or, or in some place we show view frustums or view lines. So I turned all off, and you can turn them all back on or off. We allow you to select what spacecraft you show, whether you, oh, let's turn on the minor moons for Jupiter. So there'll be more moons will show up here as I scroll back. Now, besides scrolling back with the scroll wheel, you can grab this little jog wheel and pull it back. Okay, while, you're, while you're doing that, and so sure. um, Kay asks, how, if they don't have uh, a mouse with the scroll wheel, how can they zoom if they just have ah, a mouse pad? There's two ways to do it. Down here on the control, see visual controls right here? There's this little what scroll wheel. It says move in and out. So as I move this up, I move in, or I move it down, I move back. So there's one way to do it, okay? Or the scroll wheel, like I'm doing now. Um, or, what was the other way? I thought of a third way, it, it escaped me now. Um, oh, duh, on your keyboard, your arrow keys in and out, or left and right, okay? Plus the gaming keys, your A, S, you know, W, X keys, those will work as well, all right? Um, so that was a great question, thank you. So I'm at Juno. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of power here. And when I say this, I, I'm not exaggerating. I literally could be here for a day and never show you the same thing twice because I'm just like messing around a little bit with time. So let me show you the way. Cassini is really, really hot right now, right? We're going to be sending it into the, into the atmosphere on the 15th of September. Let me show you, there's a couple ways to get to Cassini. One is you can move back, like I'm doing now, go to Saturn, find Cassini, right? Like this, find Cassini. Or what you can do, let's say that we're not there. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go home. I've got all minor moons turned on. You see that's crazy there. Let me let me turn off my minor moons. It's just a rendering headache for this. Let me just go back to the major moons. And I'm going to say, all right, going to go home. And I want a shortcut to get to Cassini. So under Destination tab, I'm clicking the top bar of the Destination tab. And I see I can go to destinations in the solar system, planets and moons, dwarfs, asteroids, comets. So I'm going to click on Spacecraft. And then there's a lot of missions in here. So we're going to look at outer planet missions. Now, I've got Cassini Galley. You've got all these missions for the outer planets. And if I double click on Cassini, I'll go directly to Cassini. But I'm not going to do that. You see the little carrot, little diamond that's next to it, triangle. When I click on that, this indicates that we have little bookmarks of different events. I'm going to click on the Saturn arrival and watch what happens. Traveling to Cassini will change your date and time. Are you okay with that? When we change your date and time, we warn you. So I say, okay. Now look at the clock. So it's now June 30th, 2004. There are the instrument view lines. Okay. And this is the view you would have gotten. On June 30th, 2004, at 3.42 p.m. Pacific time. Now, I'm going to go under visual controls. I'm going to turn off my view lines. Don't need those right now. 
and we're good there. So this is Cassini, and I'm going to speed up time to about 10 minutes a second, and you're going to watch it do make a couple neat maneuvers. It's going to turn so that the that the um, high gain antenna blocking any potential particles that were in that ring plane. And I'm going to follow it, and you'll see when you see the uh, engine come on. That's exactly when the burn occurred. I'm going to scroll back. And you'll watch it do its burn to slow it down so it would be captured into Saturn's orbit. And then oh, I've got my hands off. Every motion you see Cassini making during this entire mission is precisely what the spacecraft did based on the reconstructed kernels from the spacecraft. Okay? If you to the view, turn the view lines on, you'll see which instruments are pointing where. Now you could do this for the entire mission. So this is just, you know, this is one location, one place. The other place is kind of fun is let's look at the Enceladus, one of the Enceladus flybys. So I'm going to take you to October 28th, 2015. And this is real time. Now that was sped up 10 minutes a second. This is one second per second. You see Cassini approaching um, Enceladus. And I'm going to let it get close. And I want you to look at, I'm going to pause. Now, if you look at the surface of Enceladus, you see it looks a little fuzzy, all right? I need to show you a visual control that I think you're going to appreciate. Under visual controls, we have a button that's called high quality, and it changes the texture maps that are placed on the planets from 4K, excuse me, from 2,000 pixels around the equator, excuse me, from 4,000 pixels around the equator to 16,000 pixels around the equator. So I'm going to click high quality and watch, the, watch what happens to the surface of Enceladus. You see it get cleaner there? Well, I hope you did. Um, now I'm going to go back to real rate. In fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn off all the lines. There are no lines in space, right? I'm going to turn on real rate, and I'm going to let you watch this. And if you were with Cassini on that day, this is what you would have seen as a human. We don't change scale. We don't change size. You can zoom in and out on Cassini. We don't allow you to change its trajectory. This is where it was. So I'm going to, if you look the other direction, check out this view. Isn't that gorgeous? There's, there's Mars. There's the Earth. There's the Sun. That's what you'd have seen. And by the way, those plumes coming out of the bottom, those are modeled. We do know that there are these, uh, I, I, they're not geysers per se, but they're, they are plumes coming out of what we have nicknamed the tiger stripes. I'm now, I'm going to double click on the planet, excuse me, on the moon and show you. You see how these stripes are, are, are the, the plumes are lined up along these four stripes? That's liquid water, right? And as I zoom in, I'm going to turn the light on, the movie light. Notice the color. Is that color reminiscent of like a glacier ice on the earth, that bluish color when you compress water? So one of the places this ice goes, there's no atmosphere. It blowing out into space, so what goes up must come down. So you got these beautiful blue ice ridges, and I'm going to scroll out here. I'm looking for hello. I have lost. How could I possibly lose Saturn? Okay, I'm going to double click on Saturn, and I want you to look at see this ring right here. That ring is partially composed of the ice coming out of those, quote, tiger stripes from Enceladus. Cassini taught us a lot of things about this system. All right, so I'm going to go ahead, turn my lines and such back on, and I'm going to move on now. Oh, gosh, no, I'm not. i got one more thing to show before I, I leave here. Um, let's do it. I lost my train. Let me go back here and turn these back on. It's hard to navigate without my lines. All right. So I've shown you that you can manipulate by just clicking and dragging. You can change your date and time by just entering down to the tenth or the hundredth of a second. You know, if I want to go to 20, 2020, of course Cassini will be gone. But so if I want to, you know, I mean, you can set the date and time to any time you want between, you know, 1950, 2050. I can set my speed and rate either by sliding this backwards and forwards in time. 
or picking, picking a number out of the menu. I can change, um, well, I can change uh, my visual, I showed you visual controls. All right, what I want to do now though is uh, show you, I showed you destinations so you can like do bookmarks to jump to different places and, and destinations, but I haven't shown you tours and features. I'm going to show you uh, two features that I know this group will be interested in. One is a feature that we wrote inside eyes. So a feature or a tour is basically using the engine of eyes and putting a specialized, even a more simplified interface about a particular subject. And you notice the top one's Cassini. I'll get back to that. But I want to show you the Eclipse feature. This is kind of fun. We whipped this up in about a month. You click Feature, and now we are loading a new interface and all of the data surrounding the, the I call it the Great American Eclipse of 2017. I also have my Night Sky Network postcard with my little pinhole camera. I wanted to show that at the beginning, and I forgot. Hey, thank you. <laughs> yeah, these are very cool. Um, but you can see that you see a button that says Explore. I'm going to go ahead and hit the Explore button. And what you're going to see now is a split screen where um, the left part of the screen is a telescopic view, let's say a 1.5 degree view of the sun. But look right below, you see a time rate. I'm going to change this to one second per second. So this is a real-time visualization of the eclipse from anywhere on the planet. Okay? So right now, you can see there's a big flag at Kansas City. But if you want to see it from Houston, I can click on Houston. And at August 21st at 9.57 a.m. Pacific time, that's what you'd see in Houston. In Vancouver, it would look like that. In New York City, it'd be, it wouldn't even started yet. Los Angeles, this is what we would see. Let's go back to New York, okay? I can go ahead and I can either grab this time slider to move it so you'll be able to see from, you know, oh, look, maximum coverage in New York City is going to occur at 11.42 a.m. or what? What's that? 2.42, 2.43 a.m. in New York. This will go with your local time. Um, I can click on somewhere in Venezuela. Okay. How about those guys? They're going to have about a 50% eclipse, but theirs is at 12.55 our time. Right? If you want to get fancy, you can say custom. Enter your own latitude and longitude, and then save it into into here. Uh, or if you want to see where the if you have any relatives along this line, I'm going to go ahead and say put a boundaries map on. So if you have any relatives that live along this path, you want to go visit them. I am going to be right here in Idaho Falls, and um, we are going to have a grand old time. You get the idea how this works? Awesome. We just did this little module. It's rather instructive. Uh, um, people, you know, I, I demonstrate this. Oh, I live in, they give me a place, person from England. You know what? I'm clicking on, oh, I can't see it. But if you just go across to Ireland, just is not much of an eclipse, all right? Hmm. Get the idea of this, okay? So this is a feature. It's specifically about the eclipse. We do have one, by the way. If you go to eyes.nasa.gov and go to, you click on the eclipse little icon there. We have one that works in a web browser that works, that I demonstrated on my iPhone, iPad, Android tablet, that has more features than this. If you click it, it actually does a Google location lookup. It gives you the exact, you, know, you can click anywhere on the map, and it'll tell you where you are. Um, we're starting to translate this from a game engine that requires a download and an install into a uh, WebGL so you can do all these things from the browser. Our first module is this Eclipse module for that. I'm not demonstrating that now. Um, I'm going to pop back into Eyes on the Solar System. Oh, that looks fun. Back up in time, clean that up. So under Tours and Features, I showed you this one. This is a very simple feature. Let me show you our, to, to date, the most complex feature, and that's the up -kiss, you know, the Cassini module. This module gives you a complete history of the mission from shortly after separation to its demise, all right? Now, we've learned that some people, we have audiences of various um, interest levels. And so at, at one point, 
we would take you into, you know, into a user interface that you didn't know what to do. So some people were stymied. So we decided we were going to give people just two buttons and only explain one. So if you look at it right now, I'm not touching anything, but the programmer is giving you highlights from the Cassini mission. So even if you don't touch anything, you get a little show, all right? And then this button down here at the right, that's our full screen button. So if you don't want to be full screen, you don't have to be. We always recommend full screen. <coughs> well, as soon as you hit explore, now we open up a, the world of Cassini. And honest to God, I could, it would take me two hours to demonstrate this. So I'm just going to give you the highlights. This is the home page that gives you access to these various major portions of the, the app. So there's the mission button. I'll click on the mission button. Now, this is all about the mission. In other words, I can look at the mission trajectories, mission events, mission years, so or the grand finale. Before I do that, I want to show you this timeline down here means something. If I click on it and slide it, I can slide this or go all the way back to the beginning of the mission. If I want it, so I'm going to go back here. I'm clicking now. See these? These are every one of the encounters with every one of the moons. You can ride along with Cassini during its entire mission and watch what it did. So I'm going to just click a simple mission trajectory. Now this is not an animation. We are rendering this in real time on the game engine in this, excuse me, on the graphics engine in this laptop. So this is the primary mission. Of course I can zoom in. Here's, I'm going to just draw them all. Let's just do them all. So it's going to draw the primary. Then we're going to change the color for the Equinox mission and then the Solstice mission. You'll see it. What's fun about it is it's kind of a work of art. So as I scroll in, The performance here, if you're on your own machine, it's very, very smooth. I'm looking over at my Mac and seeing that's quite jumpy. But you're gonna, I'll come in and you'll see the proximal orbits inside. Look at these orbits here. Like, what, 1,800 kilometers or miles off the surface of Saturn. And this is where it ends, okay? Um, so this is just, you know, back to the Cassini mission. I can say... Um, all the events, so here's a list of some highlights, events, the Earth flyby, first Venus flyby, launch, whatever you want, okay? So that's the mission clip, or the mission module. Here's the, the rings of the science of Saturn module. So you can do, hey, let's compare the size of Saturn with other features. So there's with the Earth. Let's compare with, oh, come on, Earth with its large neighbor Jupiter. How do they compare in size? And if I rotate, I can click on Jupiter and Saturn. You'll see that they, they move in concert. So if I scale one up, the other scale, so they'll always be in scale with each other. So let's go to, let's compare it with uh, Mars. Get the idea? All right, so this is a compare size. If I go back to, um, if I leave the compare size mode, go back to, Science of Saturn. I can look at the interior. We do a little cutaway. And it's in 3D as well. Look around. Um, if you want to read more on these things, there's a little read more. Okay. Uh, I'm going fast here because I do want to get to exoplanets and give you a little time to, to talk about this. Show its magnetosphere. Uh, here's a whole section on the rings of Saturn where you can look at uh, different kinds of the dip you look at Saturn's rings through different filters you can, this is just a visual with its moons here's an enhanced enhanced view with all the rings there's what you get in the near infrared ultraviolet this is what Huygens so this is pioneer the best we can see from pioneer in 1979 look right here's the view from Huygens in 1659 <laughs> then a, a little schematic diagram of the rings all right we put a lot of time into this one. Cassini gave us some extra money to do this, so we did it. Now, the moons of Saturn is awesome. So let's say you want to do Titan. Let's say it's, um, so here's Titan. It's about Titan. You can say um, Titan images, Titan moons. You know what? Let me go back to moons for a second. I'm looking for, oh, moon flybys. I'm sorry. So moon flybys. 
There's 127 Titan flybys. Every one of them here is done. Enceladus, Dione, every flyby. So let's just pick, we'll pick a Titan flyby. I probably should have, I'm just going to grab ah, the last one and watch it, okay? So they're doing some uh, work there. You're going to see it do some more. The instruments, but any one of these, doing some more radar work. Oh, by the way, if you want, you can turn on, you turn off the atmosphere, show radar map. You download and show the radar map. It's doing some radar work there. And that those motions are what it did. So you get the idea. You can do that for any of the uh, any of the flybys. That's the moons. This is the grand finale. Final transmission. We're working on we're gonna redo this. Watch this. This vector coming out, that's traveling. That TS is moving at the speed of light, by the way. It's a three hour broadcast. Did I say three hour? Yeah. It takes 80 minutes to get to the Earth. All right? But you're going to be able to watch the final transmission from Cassini back to Earth from several locations along this here. Um, oh, here you go. Check this out, Cassini images. We're making this larger, but what we did here is, is you see the image on the right. This is an actual image from our photo journal. This is a representation from Cassini. This is not a picture. So I'm going to pick, uh, let's pick... Um, this image here. So there, there's where Cassini was. Now we're zooming in. This is the this is the eyes view. This is reality, right? So if you want to see where Cassini was, you click Cassini view. That's where Cassini was when it took that picture and the field of view. If you want to see the camera view, you come in. We did this for several images. We've got. Here are your choices of things you can look at. See if I can find a cool one here. Some rings all lined up for some spacecraft. Um, oh, this is cool. And we did this just by taking the same time the image was done. Again, that's a reproduction in the eyes. You can do this yourself just by going to this time and then, you know, looking out the looking. We did them for you. Okay, I got to leave this. I could be here a long time. So I'm going to go ahead. Any questions before I go here? Because i got to kind of hurry. All right, let's go back to eyes. Yeah, we'll just give a quick time check here. We've got uh, Dave and I need a couple minutes at the end, and so we right. have uh, probably about seven or eight minutes for you. All right, so let me do this. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to escape out. I'm going to close this window. I'm going to go back. I'm going to restart. Check it for we. Always phone home when we start this. Now I'm going to take you to eyes on explants. Now, what's different about this is um, this is a visualization of one database. It's the NEXI, the NASA Exoplanet Science Database that's housed at Caltech. Okay? And what we do is every night, now when I start this, you may hear something going on in the background. I'm going to go full screen. And I don't know if you can hear it, but there's a there's some music playing. There's going to be a narrator. We'll start up here. And the narrator, Joe Pateski, one of our astronomers, is reading this text that come in the box. I'm going to turn her off because as much as I enjoy Joe, it will distract me. But this basically is a visualization of that database. It's just one big database. And we went in, and every night we checked to see what the new planet count so there have been 3,483 confirmed exoplanets discovered around 2597 stars as of about 1 o'clock in the morning, this morning. No Earth-like planets. I don't want to get into discussion what that means. There's a nice fight going on about Earth-like, Earth-sized. I don't want to go there right now. That will take up the rest of our time. But I want you to look around and see that um, that. There's one of the best examples. Oops, I just accidentally clicked on a star. I got to go up here and click on home again. Sorry. One of the best examples of observational bias you'll ever see is looking at the Kepler cone. Oh, I did it again. Got to be careful because if you click on one of these stars, we fly you to that system and apply all the data about that system to our visualization. Okay? So what you're looking at here is I'm going to scroll back. I'm scrolling back. You're going to see where this is in the Milky Way. 
So we've covered not very much. Okay. Um, scroll in. There are many ways to slice and dice this, da uh, this database. I, if I double click on the sun, no, okay, I'm just going to scroll in. There's, um, you know, there's our solar system. Okay. Uh, I can go to any one of these. So if I, if I just click on, so here's, uh, here's 16 light years away. It's got two planets. Now we're going to fly out to that system. And we're going to look at it. Okay. You can see that one's really close, going very fast. It's 28 weeks per second. Let's slow that down. And I can do things like, I don't really like this system. I just picked one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to, uh, uh, let's go back to the home. Let's pick like a famous system, right? Like we made a, we made a, uh, uh, we had a press release about the Trappist system with the seven Earth side planets. And if you watch that press release, they actually used eyes to demonstrate some of the things they found. So I'm going to click on this, take you to this system. And then we can look at the system, and there they are, in relative to one another. Okay, and again, if I click on something like I'm going to pick the well, let's start with showing the habitable zone. So where in this system will liquid water remain a liquid? Will water remain a liquid year-round? It would be in that zone. You say, wow, look at Kevin. There's three planets in the habitable zone. Say so how if this is the habitable zone, let's compare it to like our solar system. But wait a minute. Mercury is all way inside, but it's a different star type. This star is not as hot as our star, so the habitable zone can be much closer. Now, every one of these has an artist concept. One of our uh, Robert Hurt, a great artist from Caltech, did our planets on this visualization. So I'm going to go to the first one. Double click on it will take you to Trappist 1E. It's tidally locked, so the ocean side's always facing the sun, and the far side, we think, well, he represented it as a big ice dome. Um, let's go back out to, uh, well, let's compare size. We can compare size with the Earth. We have a limited comparison here, that or Jupiter. Okay, compare them there. But you know, if we want to visit, how far away is this thing? So we have a button for that. How long to travel here? So with an Audi doing 60 miles an hour, it would take 441 million years. Uh, we're advising you try a different way to get there. Let's try a jet. Clearly a jet traveling 600 miles an hour should cut that way down. Okay, 44 million years. How about at the speed of light? No time at all. I'll tell you one funny story that I got to go. I was showing this to a group of kids, and I was making this comment. Well, you know what? It's going to take a long time to get there. And some little kid yells, I'm going to make it, but you won't. So, gee, that's nice, kid. You know? You're probably right. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, I want to move on to show one more thing here. You can search by, uh, let's say, by type. And you can say enter multiple selections. And now let's look at all of the ones that have stars with multiple planets. Click on stars with multiple planets. There are 572. How about those that have super Earths? Down to 156. Super Earths that uh, are visible to the naked eye? Only four. Okay, you get the idea here? All right. All right, so this is Eyes on Exoplanets. Uh, eyes on the Earth, what else can I show you? I feel like I'm letting you down. Oh, you go back to home. A couple ways to visualize. So here we have these bright stars showing you where the uh, systems are that have exoplanets. I prefer to use little icons that indicate the number of stars in a system. The color still tells you the system type. Okay, there's the Kepler field again. Um, you can also do things like most of all of our eyes products. Are you allowed to look at things in 3D? So here on the toolkit, 3D. So if you had glasses on, let me go ahead and go to one of the uh, exoplanet missions. Let's look at uh, Kepler. So if you had a blue, if you had anaglyph glasses, this would all be in 3D. It looks pretty cool. 
right? Uh, I am very aware of the time. I know I'm running out of time. I guess the last thing I want to do before allowing you to ask answer questions is please try these things. This software is relatively easy to use. If you have questions, feel free to write me. We will get back to you as quickly as we can. Um, and I would like to go, I'm going to go back to uh, Eyes on the Solar System. And um, I'm going to pause here now and turn it back over to our moderator who can moderate some questions. Or What would you like me to do? Okay. Well, we got a couple of questions here, Kevin. That's fantastic. I think about a lot of people in the chat window have been commenting about how very, sharing? very cool. Please tell me what to uh, do at this point, Brian. Yeah, go ahead and stop sharing. So lost, I can't hear you. Uh oh. Which is not good. Uh oh. Uh oh. I can hear me. David, can I you hear me? Talk? Oh, I know why. Oh, I duh. Sorry. No, to turn, I turned off my audio. Try ah. Again. Oh, good. That makes a difference. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so okay. Sorry. No, we're good. So your your stop scare, sharing uh, button should be up at the very top of the screen. I just turned it off. All right. There we go. Well, we had a lot of really good comments. Everyone's saying how cool it is. But we do have a couple of uh, questions. Um, and one person uh, asked, Joe asked, is it possible to create uh, MPEG or AVI videos from the app? Uh, can they create their own user tours to... Um, use here and then to save them. Okay, two of the most popular questions. The first one is the way we have to do it. I, I on a Mac I use QuickTime, and I'm able to to do movies using QuickTime where I can narrate them. Uh, on a PC you can use other tools. I don't do those on a PC, but we haven't built into the app yet a record capability. It's been requested. We've just never done it because when we started this, it's where do you store the data on the person's computer? Now that we're up on the cloud, it might be easier, but the answer is you can't in the app. I highly recommend the use of QuickTime. It's free to everybody on a Mac. I wish I could answer for how my producer, Jason, does it on a PC. The other thing is, as far as uh, tours go, or, or you can't yet pick uh, waypoints along the way, um, but you can do bookmarks and go from bookmark to bookmark. And on the right-hand side in eyes, you'll see what looks like little links in a chain. You can click on that and it will give you a bookmark. It will remember the settings in eyes. So that's the best answer I have at this point. Okay. Um, here's another good question. And I, and I think I know the answer to this is because this is an app that you download and it runs on your computer. And so um, Stephanie asks, is it available for Chromebooks? And I guess uh, that you really, um, well, I'll let you answer that question. So only the, the Eclipse module that we built for uh, the web. So the answer is sorry, no, but we are converting these into web applications that will run on a Chromebook. We test our apps on a Chromebook using WebGL and they do work, but so far we only have parts of eyes on exoplanets and the uh, Eclipse module. So here's a, another interesting question. Kay, this is a, you know, might be a you know, stellar cartography. And so it's, uh, uh, when you showed stars visible to the naked eye, there was a whole star field that looked like M13 or M92. How did you visually identify the four stars on the screen? Oh, uh, the, okay, because when you roll over any spot, it will tell you the star name. So if you, if you roll over any of those little uh, spots that show up, a little tooltip will tell you what the star is. The other thing too that I didn't show, in all three of our apps, there are you can put constellations up. You can turn on constellations to give you a better perspective. I hope I had answered a question. I think the question has to do, uh, um, if, mm. If I might interpret what how I would interpret it is that you know being able to recognize the stars in the star field, you probably use something like the the digital sky survey to be able to identify the uh, actual stars that you were imaging within the visualization. Is that correct? The Hipparchus catalog. Okay. 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 And we only and we only use about two thousand stars, but every star you see is in its correct relative location, brightness, and color. What I didn't do, what I like to do is I fly from the Earth out to Orion's belt with the constellations turned on and you can actually see them warp and I turn back around and look at the uh, 
sun. It's pretty cool. Okay. So they all all in the correct place. And you could, I didn't show it, but there's a free fly button at the bottom that allows you to use your uh, game controls. And you literally can put that camera anywhere, inside or outside the solar system, period. Okay, I'm gonna. I've got two more here that I'm gonna. Sure. You know, we we can't always get to every question, um, but this one sounds really interesting. Brian asks, uh, in a solar system mode, can a user input orbital elements for an object such as a new asteroid and then play with orbital mo mechanics of that new object? I'm guessing that that means is an no. open source. No, no, it's not. But the new version we're writing for WebGL will be open sourced. I'm sorry, no, you can't do that. Um, Simple answer. Well, maybe the future. So yes. Well, yes. no, we, we will. In the new version, we will. Okay. Excellent. Sweet. And then let's make this the, the last one, which is a really great question and uh, just kind of gives us a chance to reiterate what we talked about earlier. Is the app available to the public at large? Can we uh, use it at outreach events to inform or direct our public to download the app? The answer is absolutely. We highly encourage it. Uh, in fact, I didn't even mention this. But the answer is yes. Use this in any way you want. Get screen captures. Use them. This was, I like to say that this was made, this is no additional cost to U.S. taxpayers. Okay? So you may use it as you see fit. If you do use it, we just credit, you know, uh, JPL and Caltech. But if you don't, no one's going to die. All right? Uh, we want people to use this. Please do. We do have versions that we made specifically for museums and science centers that are what we call the kiosk versions. Like instead of like in Eyes on the Earth, you have 40 buttons you can choose. The kiosk version, you get four choices, 40 to four, okay? But it's highly scripted. Okay, great. And David put the, uh, the link for the app in the chat window. It's just simply eyes.nasa. Gov. Yes, it and uh, it's got to be one of the simplest URLs that you could even possibly think of. So, um, so that's all for tonight. Um, you'll be able to find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network uh, website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities and the link to uh, NASA Eyes. So we'll post this presentation on the um, Night Sky Network YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Uh, Kevin, I want to thank you very much for this. This is a fantastic one. Um, you know, we I love the tool um, and and I love the enthusiasm that you bring to this. That's that's just wonderful. It's infectious, is what it right. is. Thank you. I, I as you can tell, I enjoy it. So yes, you do. My pleasure, Brian. Dave, <laughs> take now, care.